Welcome to Texas McCombs Presents from the University of Texas at Austin. Greetings to our alumni around the world. The Texas McCombs Presents Speaker Series brings together the University of Texas's distinguished faculty and top C-level executives, many of whom are alumni. It's more important than ever to stay connected and share insights about our ever-changing world and economy. And we're glad you're joining us. Before we begin, a few housekeeping rules. Our esteemed faculty will share their expertise for the first 30 minutes, followed by a Q&A session of 15 minutes. Questions submitted during registration and the Q&A session on Zoom will be answered as time allows. All guests will be muted, except for the speakers. After the session, we'd love to get your feedback. So please be sure to complete a short survey. We'll send all registrants a video recording after the event. We'd like to thank our co-sponsors, Texas Real Estate Center, an interdisciplinary program in finance, real estate, law, design, and urban planning for undergraduates and graduates. Moody College of Communication, changing the world in journalism, public relations, advertising, radio, TV, and film, and communication sciences. IC Squared Institute, delivering impact with research and programs that drive regional economies. LBJ Urban Planning Policy Lab, informing future urban policy and innovative strategies for Texas cities and beyond. Texas X's, the official alumni network of UT Austin, connecting more than 540,000 Longhorns around the world. Texas Executive Education, with the full spectrum of courses and custom programs to keep you, your team, and your company at the forefront of business. Please sign up for our newsletter to learn about future Texas McCombs Presents events and leading edge research from McCombs faculty. Thank you for attending today. And now let's begin today's conversation. Hello, I'm Lillian Mills, Dean of the McCombs School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin. Welcome to Texas McCombs Presents, a virtual event where distinguished UT faculty and industry leaders discuss critical business issues. Texas McCombs is a shining example of the University of Texas at Austin's promise. What starts here changes the world. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon. Hook 'em horns. All right. Uh, thank you, Lil, for that great <laughs> introduction. Uh, and thank you for joining us uh, today for our webinar on the future of work. I am Greg Hallman. I'm a senior lecturer in finance and real estate at the McComb School of Business. I also serve as a director of our Texas Real Estate Center, and I am the faculty director of our, our McCombs Real Estate Investment Fund, a public-private fund where students invest money in real estate investment trusts and in private equity deals. Uh, I am joined today by uh, two faculty that are outside of McCombs, so I want to thank them first for joining us in our, in our webinar series. Uh, uh, first, let me introduce Stephen Pettigo, uh, the founding executive director of the LBJ Urban Labs and a professor of practice at the LBJ School of Public Affairs, and Craig Watkins, the founding director of the Institute for Media Innovation and the Ernst A. Sharp Centennial Professor at Moody College of Communication. So welcome, Stephen and Craig, and thank you for joining us in our McComb series. Uh, we look forward to a great conversation here. So let me, let me start us out by pointing out that the future of work is, is very much in the minds of real estate investors. Uh, real estate houses the economy. And when the economy goes through a shock like we've been through and people rearrange how they work and live, we're gonna see the effect of that in, in real estate uh, property values. So I, I wanna start out by, by, I wanna report on some publicly traded returns of various real estate property sectors this is from pre-COVID to today, okay? And so these are from the REIT market. A REIT is a real estate investment trust. Uh, the, the point of uh, making sure you know this is from the REIT market is these are, uh, these are nice properties. REITs own A-level core properties in some of the biggest cities all over the country and, and really in any city that has commer uh, material commercial 
real estate space. So these are REIT returns across some various property sectors. As a benchmark, overall, the property market as reflected by REITs is up 10% from pre-COVID levels. And so if you bought the entire index of real estate, it's actually worth more than it was pre-COVID, but that masks a lot of variation in the property type. So let's start with office. Office is down 7% from pre-COVID and there is a, a real geography split in that data. Uh, gateway cities or what we know as 24 hour cities, New York, San Francisco, Seattle, those office values have suffered a lot more than uh, cities in say, say non gateways, Phoenix, Atlanta, Dallas, Austin. Uh, there's some evidence that those gateway cities are suffering from a reliance on mass transit and some workers might be, be worried about using mass transit here during a pandemic. You know, that might be a factor. It also might be that those are cities that have a lot of potentially remote workers in, in knowledge industries, uh, in tech. And so that might be why we see it. So office is down overall. Hotels are down about 4% from pre-COVID levels. And there's an industry split in that one. Uh, resort hotels are actually doing pretty well. So if you look pre-COVID to today, resort hotels are doing pretty well. Business hotels in cities are really suffering. And we can take from that data that, that people are, they're okay with traveling again, but not traveling for work. Uh, that uh, workers are telling managers that they're not comfortable with traveling for work because they just got back from Cabo, I guess, but they're, they're not yet traveling for work. Uh, malls are having a very tough time in this, in this pandemic uh, economy. And that, that continues a long slide from 2016. The malls are down 13%. It was a body blow, the pandemic was, to shopping inside an enclosed area uh, with a lot of other people. Just didn't, didn't work well. Retail strip centers, though, especially grocery anchored retail strip centers, are doing quite well. They're outside. Those stores are not as crowded. And, and a lot of those places are back to, to COVID levels in terms of valuations. Uh, the big winner as you might imagine, is supply chain real estate. So industrial assets, warehouses involved in the distribution channel, that sector is up 41% from pre-pandemic levels. I mean, as we've watched, there's certainly a connection between the pain we see in the malls and the gain we see in the warehouses. I mean, that's, that's Amazon, that's the effect of all this online shopping that's come up. Uh, and one last interesting asset class I wanna, wanna, wanna put out there before we start a discussion with my panelists is uh, single family rentals. So large REITs and private equity firms have very much gotten into the business of buying single family homes and then renting them to simply to rent them back out to people. And uh, two of the REITs are big players in that invitation homes came out of Blackstone's early efforts to buy single family properties. Uh, after the, the financial crisis of 08. So imitation homes and American homes for rent. These are REITs that, that own and rent out single family homes. For some perspective, these homes are on average a little bit less than 2000 square feet. And they rent for between 1700 and 1900 a month, depending on what kind of city they're in. Okay, but they are single family homes. Imitation owns 80,000 of those rental homes and American homes for rent owns 53,000. Both REITs are valued 30 to 40% higher than they were pre-COVID. So, so, so people wanting to rent single family homes has been a great business, continues to be a great business. Uh, Blackstone's B REIT scooped up 20,000 single family rentals over the summer, a pretty big deal. So that's, a, that's an, an interesting point that we think is very much driven by the phenomenon we're gonna start talking about now with the panelists, which is the remote work phenomenon that, that we've seen. Uh, so I have not forgotten about my distinguished panelists. And let me start with uh, Professor Watkins at the Moody School. And, and certainly Stephen, you and I will join in and, and chime in uh, when we can add to what Craig is talking about. So Craig, I've, I've talked through kind of how the workforce has, has shuffled and the effects that we see in real estate asset values at the property level. Uh, this rise of remote work is really, I mean, when we think about work, this is what happened to us in the, in the pandemic. So based on your research, we know what's happened to us, but what can we expect going forward for the future of remote work? Is it here to stay, you think? Yeah, no, uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, I, I think there's a, a growing consensus that remote work is likely to be a permanent fixture uh, moving forward. The questions are, in other words, right, the idea that 100% of an organization's employees would report or come into the office five days a week, 
those days are likely, um, you know, gone. If, uh, certainly uh, for the not too distant future, if not forever. And so, what we're likely to see, right, is a this notion of, of, of a hybrid model. But even with that, right, there are a, a number of questions that are that are beginning to emerge. Um, you know, I'm I'm hearing and seeing a, a lot of uh, concerns around what what some researchers are referring to as a proximity bias. And what I mean by that, right, is this the idea that uh, remote workers compared to in-person workers may face certain disadvantages. The idea, right, that um, that remote workers uh, perhaps are, are perceived as, as being uh, less engaged, uh, less accessible, uh, and therefore, right, certain advantages, you know, the idea of you know, spontaneous conversations, the idea of sort of being on site, being present, you know, being in the, the, the view of managers and executives will, will play well for those who are, who are coming in person. And so there's, there's a concern, right, that there, that there may be some bias towards those who are in person versus those who are operating remotely. And so this idea, right, that we, we may have, right, with this emerging remote workforce, sort of two classes of workers, uh, those who are working remotely versus those who are working uh, in person. And so what does that mean uh, in terms of moving forward? And it points to something that I haven't really seen a, a lot of uh, conversation around. And that is right, the, the future of management and leadership in this environment. In other words, how will managers and leaders design uh, workplace procedures? How will they design organizational culture that in some ways uh, mitigates uh, these concerns about uh, proximity bias, for example? And so I think, uh, you know, as we uh, certainly see the uh, arrival, the expansion uh, of this remote workforce uh, and more and more people preferring to work remotely, there's certainly going to be some challenges, this notion of proximity bias being one of them. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great point that you make that, uh, you know, it, it, we design these firms, these management, these chains of command and these management structures for a very different time. And this remote work was forced on us very quickly. And we haven't had a chance to really think what would that design look like in this world yet? Because we have been reacting the whole time. And, and I do think that that's some of the, the anchoring that we feel from firms wanting to get back in, in person because they were, set, they were really set up for that. Uh, and, and Greg, if I, if I could add one more thing, you know, it's, it's you, I know we'll we'll talk a lot about you know the changing workforce and and remote workforce in, in particular, but it, it also should be noted right that the majority of U.S. workers and certainly the majority of workers around the world have little if any access to remote work. So there's there's a whole nother divide in terms of how we think about the economy moving forward and and the future of work. Uh, and these are certainly issues that we might want to attend to as well. You know that that's that that's. That's something that I saw in the questions, and I just want to mention to those who submitted questions that I, I read through seven pages of questions this morning a few times. And, and right, there, the point was made by a number of, of participants that we are talking about, you know, the effect of remote work, and there are a great many jobs that are simply not suited at all for this, uh, for remote work, that's for sure. Uh, let me stay with you for just a second, uh, Craig, before we move on to Stephen and talk about how these worker effects then drive differences that we might see in the design of cities. So in terms of various parts of the remote workforce, and so for one is, is the gender effect. We know that the pandemic was very difficult for working women with school age children who all of a sudden uh, had children at home all the time that they felt maybe they needed to keep an eye on. Uh, and we also have another part of the workforce. Uh, so I want to talk, ask you about how we think the future of work might benefit or hurt working women going forward. And also, uh, let's talk a little about uh, millennials and, and Gen Z. We know from teaching, all three of us know from teaching these young students, that they, they have a different expectation about what their life at work is going to be than we had when we came marching out of school in the 80s. You know, our expectation was eight to five five days a week, two weeks of vacation, that's it, go, you know, but we don't see that anymore. And so maybe this remote work will, will, will allow firms to maybe meet in the middle with these millennials. So have you seen things in your research of, about how this might, uh, you know, help with uh, or address, be affected with gender effects and, and generational? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and a, a lot of the research that we've done in terms of interviews with, with different, um, you know, segments of the workforce, including women and, and young women in particular, but just, you know, taking a step back more broadly speaking, you know, 
many of us have likely heard of, of, of some people referring to this, this pandemic um, cause uh, recession as a she session. And this idea, right, that it has disproportionately impacted women. And I think historically speaking, this is the first you know, recession that we've had in this country where women have suffered you know, significantly more job losses than their male counterparts. Wow. Um, and, and for the reasons that, that you've noted, uh, you know, Greg, it's, it's primarily right driven by the fact of, of the need to, to, to take on caretaking responsibilities at home. If that's kids who weren't able to go to school, if that, you know, um, you know older parents or, or others who are in need of care, that work tends to disproportionately fall on women. And so it, in, in some ways, right, was one of the major catalysts for something like, what, 2.4, 2.5 million women exiting uh, the paid labor force uh, during the course of this pandemic. Now, some have come back, but many more have, have not come back. And this speaks, you know, I think, again, to a larger sort of historical tension, and that is the degree to which women are disproportionately sort of segregated into kind of lower wage uh, occupations, service occupations. We know that those industries were hit particularly hard by the pandemic. And as a result, you know, women suffered, uh, you know, massive levels of, of unemployment. But it also has implications, right, in terms of um, stalled careers for women. It has implications in terms of the financial impact on families, in terms of loss of income. And certainly, right, it has a significant impact on the broader economy. Um, and so, you know, this, this speaks to, you know, the, the structural challenges and concerns that, that persist you know, in our economy, in terms of some of the gender dynamics, uh, we know that historically women have been much more likely than their male counterparts to work in what's referred to as remote or uh, flexible jobs. But as researchers have noted over the years, you know, individuals working in those jobs, and again, disproportionately women, oftentimes encounter like what's referred to as a tax or a penalty. In other words, right, uh, they tend to be paid less, uh, they tend to have uh, fewer opportunities for promotion uh, and, and upward mobility. And so in that sense, right, it, it has a significant impact on just the quality of life and the quality of work opportunities and experiences uh, that women oftentimes uh, face. And so in this sense, uh, you know, thinking about uh, as we move forward, you know, the kinds of, you know, policy responses that are, that are simply required in terms of better work protections, uh, in terms of destigmatizing a flexible work or remote work, and the degree to which uh, you know these kinds of policy changes or cultural shifts, you know, might uh, you know have a greater, more positive impact on women's experience in the market or in the, in the paid labor force. That's, it, that's great. It sounds like you guys have thought about that a lot, which is a fantastic uh, to hear. Let me, let me move. Yeah, you know. Go ahead. I, I was just going to say that you know, in terms of your. Um, you know, your, your question about millennials and Gen Z, you know, we, um, you know, when we did uh, some research, you know, looking particularly right at this generational segment, uh, and I write about this in, in a book that I recently published called Don't Knock the Hustle, which is really an attempt to sort of understand how, you know, younger people are sort of navigating what was already, right, a precarious economic environment even before the pandemic. But what we, what we understood and what we've learned from, you know, doing research with millennials and Gen Z, and you're right, Greg, you alluded to it earlier, is that they have a very different kind of set of expectations in terms of what work will look like. And it just so happens, right, that those expectations that they have are in some ways becoming well aligned with the emerging expectations that we're likely to see moving forward kind of post-pandemic. For example, um, you know, uh, a preference for, for greater, uh, more flexible work. Uh, a preference for greater work-life balance, um, you know, emphasis on mental health and some of the concerns associated with that. We're seeing, right, uh, many organizations and companies beginning to attend to the mental health concerns uh, that are emerging, you know, in their organizations. And so this, it's this idea, right, of sort of quality of life uh, in terms of, you know, uh, how work impacts that. And so for many young people, right, choosing jobs that don't necessarily offer higher pay, that's not the only sort of, you know, criteria that they have, but again, offer a higher quality of life and sort of along these other metrics or other indicators beyond just, you know, salary or income. And so I think, right, this, this and we're seeing one other thing, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn this back over to you. Um, more generally speaking, we're hearing a lot about, you know, the, the great resignation, many people resigning or switching jobs or leaving jobs. We were already seeing some of this behavior with millennials and Gen Z prior to the pandemic. In other words, right, there was this reputation, right, that millennials, for example, were fickle, that they were just, you know, changing jobs, job switching, job hopping. 
And the data doesn't really support that. What it does suggest, right, is that they were much more likely than prior generations to engage in what we might call occupational switching. And that is to say, to, to switch careers or to experiment with new careers. And now what we've seen, right, at, in the, as a result of this pandemic, more and more people, right, beginning to, as they think about their lives, as they think about, um, you know, what it means to uh, have quality of life in the context of the pandemic and the context of greater social isolation, more and more people opting to pursue career pathways that bring them more fulfillment and more personal rewards. Yes, and and I, you know, just to add on to that, uh, before we we start to, uh, discussing Stevenson's uh, effects on the city level, I I do think that 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 for over time, firms and labor will sort themselves out into those that prefer remote work for various reasons and those that don't. I'm interested to see whether there'll be a pay differential, uh, as you mentioned, that there, there might be, but that there might not be. We'll see. So uh, those are some great insights, certainly, on the, uh, on the, the work with us. Stephen, go ahead. Yeah, Craig, I was going to ask you, one of the things that I'm interested in is, 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 this, is this blending environment. So I... I, I I wonder, right, do you not have as many people doing remote work or traditional work, but really do most people end up in a blended environment, right, where they spend a couple of days a week in the office and then a few uh, days obviously working remotely somewhere? How does that play out in, in, in terms of culture, in terms of your thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, it's, it's a great question, and it's, it's, it's likely the preferred model, you know, to the extent that remote work will become a permanent feature of the, the, the sort of economy, jobs economy moving forward. Um, you know, if you have a situation, right, where, where people are appearing in person, at least, uh, you know, sometime during the week, two, three days, whatever the case might be, it gives you an opportunity, right, to perhaps maintain uh, the development of a workplace culture, of an environment where there's a sense of cohesion, integration, uh, people um, sort of of aligned with each other, networking, you know, all of these kinds of things. And this is really important, right, for, for people who are just starting careers, younger workers. Uh, we know, for example, again, that women, people of color who tend to, you know, face additional challenges, that being on site, being in person is going to be important moving forward, because we know, right, that those things tend to be associated with greater mentorship, greater sponsorship, building that social capital, that social network within an organization or within an industry. And so having a presence, right, and being able to connect with people, to, to share time with people in person is going to be important. And so I think, you know, in, in, in that sense, right, managers and executives who are sort of rethinking and reinventing these workplace environments will certainly need to keep that blended model in mind insofar as it gives us, to some degree, right, the, the potential benefits of, of both worlds, that is remote and in person. Yep. Yeah. Totally. I mean, because I know those people like me, the city guys are, I mean, I think that's the model we're hoping that the world switches to, right? I mean, or if not, we've got a, a, a big, big problem on our hands otherwise. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. so, and, and I completely agree with both you guys. I mean, and I think that that just the variety, it, it's so much easier to do a job five days a week when you can have a day or two at home. And I think that's going to be, I tell our students, I say, I think you're going to have it a little better off than we did. Uh, and like, I do think that that'll be, so Stephen, let me turn to you. I mean, you and I share sure. an interest in cities and, and when we invest in real estate in McCombs with our students and our funds, in the end, we're picking cities is what we're picking. And so that's, totally. we certainly share an interest in that. And so we've seen really devastating effects to some of these gateway cities, but we've also seen some cities that have, have maybe benefited from this. And so you do a lot of work on which cities are healthy and which cities might grow. How has this pandemic affected the way you guys think about healthy cities or growing cities? Yeah, I mean, I think this, I mean, so I would say like Craig, I think about remote work creating opportunities for cities, but also creating a set of challenges for cities as well, right? And so um, let's talk about what I think are the, the positives, right? The positives are, um, is that we've changed the economic development game, right? So cities that maybe were having a, a tough time meeting some of their needs in terms of their workforce demands, seeing declining economies, wanting to sort of uh, figure out how they could play in a, um, frankly, in a global economy that's kind of become quite spiky. Um, this creates an, uh, a, um, an opportunity for them to, to, to do that in a sense, right? Um, and, you know, you look at places like Tulsa, you look at places like Northwest Arkansas um, and other places across the country have really, in a sense, you know, put a bear hug around this idea of remote work, saying, come be a remote worker from our town. We're going to create this great work, great environment for you. You. We're going to give you a little cash to come do it. And so 
it's it's given a spark to some of these cities, right? Where where they're able to take advantage of some of the placemaking efforts that they've done in their downtowns and their in their communities, um, and really kind of put themselves on on a map. And and frankly, for for places that are some of those second and third tier cities, um, we could argue that that remote work may be one of the few life kind of one of the few talent lifelines that they had in terms of in terms of being able to meet those meet those needs. Now, on the flip side, it creates a lot of challenges, right? I think there. Um, the reason I asked Craig's question, uh, the question to Craig, is that people like me assume that there's going to be some flexibility into this, right? Um, I think that when, if you talk to city city officials, you know, folks that uh, manage downtowns, um, we hope to God there's going to be some flexibility. If not, if not, we have a complete transformation of our downtowns that are upon us, right? In terms of the way that we think about underutilized space, the way that we think about how we create community, just in terms of people coming together, in terms of that culture building, both inside and outside of the office. So there's a whole array of issues. And in fact, I would, I would submit to you that I actually think this is a really exciting time to be thinking about city building. In fact, it's one of the most uh, interesting times for me because you know, for a long time, we thought about our downtowns as places where people just came to work, right? And if you look at the traditional uh, CBD districts everywhere from you know, Dallas to Austin to even places like New York and Midtown, very much focused on that office experience. Um, but if we buy into, you know, if we buy this idea that people aren't going to be coming to work more, the rise of remote work, that's going to, as you know, uh, Greg, going to free up lots of available space. And so there's a whole remaking of our downtown opportunities, right, in terms of thinking about maybe how we address some of the affordable housing issues. We're going to be very intentional about how we create community and how we do placemaking work uh, together. Um, you know, it, it creates opportunity around how we address some of the issues around our transportation problems that we see in cities. Um, you know, less people on uh, less people on transit. That raises questions about how cities may think about the mobility investments that they're making. So, I think when you think about it, it, it there's opportunity, but there's also some significant challenges. And, and Craig hit on some of the equity challenges that we see. Right? I'm an economic development guy by trade. I'm always thinking about this idea. You know, if we think about cities going forward, we're trying to think about how to bridge bridge divide. Remote work may be one of those things where we see a greater and greater divide. Women not being able to uh, greatly participate, some job opportunities not having the opportunity. And does that divide get larger and larger? Those are things I think we have to think about as about city, city builders, frankly. No, I think that's, I think that's a great point. We, we have, you know, right, we have various things that divide workforces now. And, and I do think that this, this might be one of them. I mean, what, what do you guys think about, do you think that this, this notion of remote work, like we all set, seem to agree that we think there's going to be a mix of it. Do, do you guys think that firms are, are going to, and this was one of the questions I got, are, are going to a lot you a number of remote days per year the way they do with vacation days or sick days or do you think it's more going to come from management that's going to say and here it's some anecdotal data from a, a, a guy that works on my street who said that his firm was thinking about everybody in the office monday uh tuesday wednesday and thursday and uh we could you could have remote days on monday and friday and that way they had everybody in they could plan on meetings or do you think it'll be more you can just take your remote day whenever you want what do you guys think? Craig, I'll let you go and then I'll take, uh, I'll follow. Yeah. You know, I think, I think right now we are, this is sort of the wild west, right? In terms of experimentation, um, you know, new models are likely to emerge, uh, different, different experiments, you know, you know, Greg, with, uh, with the different scenarios that, that you just presented. Um, you know, I think it's, uh, again, you know, an opportunity, obviously, I mean, I, I think what, what most people or more and more people are beginning to realize is what, what as a result of the last 18 months, we've been handed, right, an opportunity that, that beforehand we never would have considered, and that is the ability to really radically rethink, you know, these issues uh, in ways that, that, are, that are really quite unprecedented. And so in that sense, right, the, the idea that you would have uh, you know, the, this idea of some people, uh, you know, coming in certain days of the week, others coming in other days of the week. I do think part of it, right, is, is industry specific and even within industries, task specific, right? So some jobs, right, just are much more amenable to working remotely. Others require, right, there perhaps to be some in-person uh, component, right, in order to actually, uh, you know, fulfill the mission or to execute the task more fully. And so there's, there's just going to be variations, right, across sectors, within organizations, you see a lot of the tech companies, for example, Facebook, Twitter have announced, right, that they anticipate significant portions of their workforce moving forward, permanently working remotely. And then you look at the financial sector, right, some of the big banks, for example, investment firms, they're looking at people coming in, right, as, as still the, the, the primary model. 
And so I think it's going to vary, right? Sector to sector, industry to industry, but even more specifically, right? By job and task and responsibility within respective organizations. Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Some of, those financial some of those financial institutions are some of the largest asset holders of, of commercial real estate. So you can imagine why they want to have seats and butts, right? I mean, there's some, uh, there's some shared, some, um, some, some, um, some interest there. I, I think that's right, Craig. I think that when you look at the nature of work, right, and the way that we think about that, some tasks will be, um, there are some sectors that require um, heavy levels of interaction, right? It's, the, it's Jane Jacobs 101 in terms of the way we think about clusters and innovation. There are certain tasks that require people to come together. I don't think that actually goes away with remote work, right? We just probably become much more intentional by the way that we spend time in the office, right? And what that looks like. And so the purpose of that office and the way we think about those offices, I think will be, um, will, will change. And again, you know, from a city building perspective, I think that opens up lots of different ways to think about how we create public space and use public space, right? Um, as well as just even how um, commercial uh, tenants think about their own space in terms of do, do they do more co-working space with smaller firms to, to energize the workforce. I mean, there's lots of things that you could put on the table. I think the one thing that I want, want to stress with remote work, and, and, I, and I, we were talking about this in my class today, um, in my undergraduates, is that I don't believe that remote work is about just working from home. That's an important point to remember. Working from home is not just about working from your basement or excuse me, remote work is not just about working in your basement or working at your home office, right? Um, and so if you, if you buy into that idea that it is not just about being at home, that means that cities are gonna have to create a whole different types of new ecosystems, right? We're gonna have to intentionally think about our public space. Um, you know, the, 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 the third space, right? Which, what, you know, which is gonna become maybe a more important piece about how we bring people together. What does that remote work ecosystem look like in downtowns and communities? And if you're a suburban community, for instance, and particularly places like Texas, where our suburban communities have been, frankly, traditionally just residential, right? If you think about the areas the way we think about our, our suburban community, this is a big opportunity to reimagine what suburban communities look like in terms of the types of amenities they have, how they access, how they keep people a little bit sticky. Um, and maybe doesn't mean that um, maybe, in fact, I may be willing to live a little further out than into the urban core um, because I can get some remote work and get some co-working space or opportunity to connect with people in my, in my suburban core. So I don't have to, I don't have to commute to the, um, to the city every time. So I think it raises lots of questions, not just about culture and organizations, but culture and how we create community and think about our cities going forward. Yeah. Yeah. We've seen some no, really, no, no. we've seen some data on that, on this, in the, in that, uh, it's not so much that people are moving just everywhere, but they're moving to the suburbs of the large cities in which they, they have a home office. Because like you said, I might be able to put up with an hour commute if it's three days a week, but I certainly can't do it five days a week. And, and I also- yeah, and like if you, your, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and if you look at the migration data, I mean, there's great data that's yeah. out. I mean, if you looked at just at the way uh, the uh, data recently, look at the, US, the change of postal cold data from the US Postal Service over the, over the time that we've went through. CBRE did a wonderful, a wonderful, wonderful, uh, analysis of this. But what you find really is that most moves within a metro were local moves, yep. right? They were, they were most, they're yep. mostly local moves. Some moves to some of the resort communities that you see that are tied to sort of the superstar cities, but most of them were interregional moves. So it's not like, for instance, that people in Dallas, Texas are picking up and saying, the hell with Dallas, I'm going to move to Denver because I can work remotely. I mean, that is happening. I think that happens on some of the edges, but a lot of this is about flexibility within a metropolitan area, right? And so rather than thinking about separation of live and work and play in these districts, we may have a little bit more of a blending opportunity there, I think. And I was also wondering about like just the, the sort of downstream effects, right? So one might be, you know, if fewer people are going into, you know, office spaces, I mean, think about what that's meant in terms of fewer people commuting, right? Rush hour traffic. Uh, you know, no one, no one is raising their hand or rushing right to, to get back into that. And in fact, you know, when you look at the surveys of people who prefer remote work, that's one of the main factors that they oftentimes give for preferring remote work, right, is, is avoiding that commute. And they feel like that's time given back to them. Uh, and in some cases, right, uh, you know, quality of life uh, as well in terms of not having to deal. Uh, and we, we've all been in, in, in that situation. And then the other thing, right, if, if, if we see this sort of emerging remote workforce, uh, you know, sort of blossom and, and expand beyond what, it, what we've seen it to this point. You know, what does that mean for service workers? What does it mean for lower wage uh, workers uh, who oftentimes rely on, you know, people showing up to work in offices, going to lunch, going to dinner, traveling, staying in hotels. And so there, there are all these sort of downstream effects that I think totally. we want to keep in mind, some positive, some negative, in terms of its broader implications. But I generally, yeah. I, take, I, think, I take some comfort from the fact that 
that, you know, the, the returns that I started us out with that real estate as a whole is up 10%, even though when you look at the sector level, you see all these things. And so I guess what I'm hoping is that while say restaurants and service industries, dry cleaners, restaurants, bakeries, things like that in the CBD might move out to the suburbs and, and the same, you know, that there will be a shuffling, but that people yeah. won't. I think a lot of what we see in the spending data that came out last week and in stock market returns and it, is that the wealth and the spending seems to have been generally preserved for the majority of people. It's there's just been this big shuffling and, and look, I live in the suburbs. We could use some better restaurants. I hope it happens. Yeah. I mean, I mean, Greg, what you're describing, right. Is what folks have been talking a lot about is the idea of a 15 minute commute, right. Is that, can you get more of your services and your amenities around your resident, around your house in this 15 minute commute. And in Texas, right. We think about um, 15 minutes, a lot of Northeasterners think about 15 minute commute. Uh, Craig's been in the semester in Boston, so he knows it's a walkable city in Boston. But in Texas, our 15-minute commute may, may be 15-minute commute by car, right? So we'll have to define that in different in different ways and think about that. But again, I think this creates an, a ton of opportunity for this idea of, of complete communities. Because one of the things, the, the point that Craig makes, and I, I think about the idea of the commute, is there's been some great survey work looking at what remote workers don't want to have, and they don't want the commute back. And in fact, if you ask people what they fear the most about going back to about to work, it's not about being back in the office with their colleagues. In fact, many of them want that environment. It's they fear the commute, right? They fear the commute for their safety issue and all the health issue, but also just the amount of what it did to your quality of play, uh, your quality of life. And so, again, if 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 I, if you imagine if you're an employer, right? And you can shave some of the, you can improve someone's quality of place. One of the questions that's what does that do for productivity? You're making a much better value proposition to your workforce in terms of talent retention, and attraction, and all those types of things in a go forward basis. And, and to your point, Greg, I think one of the greatest challenges that we face for cities is, is obviously the remaking of these down, our downtowns, complete, complete communities. But people, the folks that like I work with, economic development officials, we tend to think about traded sector and export sector businesses, the innovation businesses and all those types. And those groups of business are important, but we are going to see huge impacts on these local based businesses and our local based economies, like the mom and pop shops, the things that we love to do. We already see that happening on the pandemic. And so there's going to have to be some lifelines and really some really strong thinking about how we can keep these businesses in place and how we help these businesses maybe rethink about what, what a for even for what them, what does remote work look like for the local, our local base things that we love to do every day? Yeah, you know, that's such a great point because I don't think we've done, as an economist, I don't think we've done a lot in supporting displaced industries in the past. That things happen in the global economy and a whole industry gets hurt, like the car business. And, and I do think your point is, is well taken that, that if this pandemic is going to bring about a reshuffling of the economy, that maybe we should be thinking about helping those businesses get to where they need to be without having them failing downtown and then trying to do something else. Yeah, yeah I like Because that. the dirty secret is that, the dirty secret is that 50% of Americans work in service-based work, right? Yeah. So there are 60 million Americans working in service-based work every day. Um, and so before the pandemic, there was a need to upgrade those jobs and need to think about those jobs. This accelerates that question even more from an equity standpoint, without a yeah. doubt. Yeah, and I was, I was going to add that, um, you know, so much has been said about, you know, this this pandemic and its impacts, right? And one of the things, right, is, is the breach, which has just accelerated, you know, trends that were already kind of, you know, in, in formation, um, you know, remote work, uh, for example, uh, telework, uh, the increasing use of technology, right, to sort of uh, enhance productivity, communication, what have you. Um, you know, one of the the, the uglier side of this, right, is the degree to which it shone a, a bright light on the inequities, right, in our economy. And so as we, as we think about, right, the concentration of wealth and, and even, right, the, the concentration of remote work that we're discussing here, again, right, is only uh, going to impact a, a fairly small segment of, of the broader sort of, you know, working population. But what about those, right, who are in lower, lower wages, low, lower educated uh, workers? Um, and so the need, right, to provide, uh, you know, access to the kinds of resources that those higher wage, higher wage earners are expecting, right? Uh, child care resources, uh, greater protections, um, you know, access to, to benefits and things of this nature uh, and better wages. And so, you know, dealing with some of these structural inequities, right, the gender implications of these structural inequities, uh, the racial and ethnic implications of these structural inequities, you know, I think, you know, addressing these issues is going to be 
a significant challenge, but also an opportunity for us moving forward. Yes, we do. We do know historically that economic shocks bring bring about the possibility of change that often doesn't happen when when the economy is just kind of cruising along. And and, and so I have been hopeful. I mean, the pain of this pandemic has been real, and, and I and, and I certainly am not making light of it. But but sometimes you, you kind of hope that an economy gets a, a, a shock and and opens its eyes to things that it had not been thinking about before. I, I mean, I do think that, you know, we're talking about remote work and yes, it's not going to be for, every, for everybody, for sure. There's probably going to be some class and wealth distinctions, but it is going to reshape kind of how our, our cities work. I, I think as a, as a finance professor who teaches portfolio diversification, I think that some of these cities found out that they were over-invested in office, in the CBD, that maybe, oh, really? you know, maybe we shouldn't have, if I'm, a, if I'm a city planning person, maybe I shouldn't have 80% of my space downtown as office, because then when one sector gets sick, I lose the whole thing, and that the city itself might start thinking about property types like a diversified portfolio and think what I need is a structure that any one part of it gets hurt might not be. Uh, or, or this might just be wishful thinking. Uh, so I see some. No, I think, I, go ahead. Yeah, Steve, no, I think, think that's that? right. I mean. I mean, I think that's, I think it's about outside class, but it's also just about sectors of based uh, of what you invest. You know, if you think about assets, cities have physical assets, they also have economic assets, right? And a lot of cities were overly invested in one versus other. You know, here in Austin, for instance, uh, we are highly, highly vulnerable to shocks like this because we've overly invested in our visitor economy, basically. That's my suggestion. Folks may not agree with me there, but we've, we have, we have, uh, we see those, we, we saw that shock happening um, across the country where you have cities uh, all throughout that have invested in one type of work or one type of economic industry over another. And now I think what this has caused on cities to do is to think not just about, you know, a diversification of their physical assets, but also about what types are their, what are their growth sectors going forward and how do they continue to think about redundancy? How do we think about supply chains, right? Economic development for such a long time was always tied to efficiency and innovation, not about redundancy and potentially um, and what that looks like in terms of supply chains. In terms, the last thing, the one thing I can, one thing I point that I would make about social safety nets, and, and, and particularly as it relates to um, post-pandemic, is that for many, many um, years we thought about infrastructure development really around digital and physical. We now, I think, one of the things that that we can say is that the pandemic has raised this question about what is the human infrastructure that's put place. And to Craig's point about um, disparity of women and people of color. The one thing that I walk away with the pandemic is that we finally realize that our child care system in this country is, is broken, right? Our, our, our child care system in this country is broken. And it is not necessarily, it's not something that just the private sector can fix or the market can fix, but the policymakers are actually going to have to play an important role if we really are truly, you know, genuine about trying to close some of these gaps systems like our child care system is going to have to be addressed from a policymaking standpoint and not just um, continuing down the path that we've done in the past because we know frankly it just doesn't it's just not working and all kinds of care as well i see there's comments about senior care and other things but i think this question about supportive care um, is, is 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 a point that i would you can make broadly i think yeah well you know we have a few minutes left uh let me just a few unfortunately but let me i've been looking at the q a uh thing and, and one thing i did want to one of, uh, let me, th let me throw out there is, uh, you know, this notion that firms that were downtown might stick offices out in the suburbs. We've been talking about some support things for, for remote workers out there, but do we do, what do you guys expect, Stephen? Like, I have some thoughts on that. I think that suburban office, we've seen some pickup in that is that, that people will move not, if their people are going to stay out there remote, maybe they move a satellite office out there. Does that sound like a reasonable plan to you? I think it's a regional plan. I think, though, the, you, that it's going to have to have more urban-like uh, amenities, right? I still think that the, the idea of walkability, the idea of collisionable, uh, you know, those casual collisionable spaces, we can't design the, the office park of the 1990s and think that it's going to hold up today. Um, so it's going to it's going to require a reimagining of what suburban space is. Look, I think what we what we know is that suburban it's, it's possible that urban areas are going to have to become a bit more suburban in terms yeah. of their characteristics. Yeah. And urban air, suburban areas are going to have to become a bit more urban in their characteristics, right? And so we may see a, a bit more blending of those spaces. So absolutely see that as a possibility. That's a great way to think about that. And uh, I, I think another good one that I have up here is, is how, 
if we're moving into a new world of work, you know, our firms, and this might be more for you, Craig, our firms thinking about how are we going to keep our employees trained? And is there a new set of skills that we need to make sure our employees have to be successful in this world that we think is going to be part hybrid and, and part in person? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, and I notice it as well. Um, again, it speaks to the extent to which a lot of this is, is just the, the big experiment or the great experiment. In other words, right, you, you can imagine that, that to the extent that remote work becomes a permanent you know, feature of our jobs landscape, that's going to require, right, not only the skills to perform that particular job role, but there are all these other you know, softer skills, social skills, informal skills about how do you navigate, how do you build connections, how do you develop relationships in this remote work environment. Um, and so those are certainly, you know, skills that, that workers are likely, you know, already experimenting with, already developing. Um, you know, we know that, that we've known for some time, right, that the rise of automation, the rise of artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, you know, other kinds of systems are creating, you know, more and more a kind of workplace precarity. Um, and so it's this idea of how do we train people, not necessarily to, to, to race against the machines, right? But, but how do they develop skills that allow them to be a, a complement to the machine, right? In other words, rather than uh, investing in skills uh, that ultimately, right, can be replaced by robotics or by AI, investing in the development of skills that are, are, are a complement or in some ways, um, you know, become, um, you know, a, a, a way of ex extending the, the capacity of those systems uh, as opposed to those systems simply taking over the task that humans do. And that's, that's about education. We haven't had time to talk about that here, but it certainly right, has to do with, with the kinds of skills that, that more and more employees will be looking for uh, and the ways in which uh, they also would be required to help uh, develop and cultivate those skills within their respective organizations. That's, that's what I'm thinking. I mean, is that, is that people like working at firms where they, they feel a culture and, and I think firms are gonna have to figure out a way to make sure that remote workers feel that culture. The thing that I miss the most about remote work, of course, is you know, seeing students in person and being with my colleagues, you know, and, and we need to find some way to get there, it looks like, uh, if we're gonna be in this, in this new world. Uh, I think we're, we're about out of time. I know I can speak for you guys. Look, we're all academics. We love experiments. And uh, this has been one uh, heck of an experiment <laughs> to watch. I, you know, I feel we feel bad about the cause, but as, as academics, we like to watch things change. And we like to think about how those changes are going to ripple through the economy. I really enjoy talking with you guys about this. Uh, I think it's been a great panel. I think we could have we could have spent a little more time uh, talking, but uh, look, I want to thank everybody for showing up. Uh, I, I thank you for sending in questions. I read all the questions this morning. I think we talked about many of those themes. Uh, also some great questions that came in in the Q&A. So uh, you will receive a recording of this conversation in a following email that you'll get from the exec ed folks. And uh, look, we hope you join us for future events. I know all three of us have had a great time getting to know each other and, and thinking more about this topic and, and talking with you guys. But uh, that's all for us today and, and uh, have a great day.